Abedino and Perpetua taking refuge in the well-defined and defended territory of the unnamed in protection, and in their absence then, their village is completely destroyed by mercenaries. It's at this point that we will then have a break, chapters 31 through 33, which will speak of the terrific plague of 1630 in Milan. And, uh, I, you know, while I haven't had a chance to read a whole lot um, uh, from the, the text, um, it's, it's amazing to read how this plague that hits Milan is misunderstood at first and then uh, treated poorly in terms of its dangerous propensity uh, for inflicting all kinds of carnage. Um, of course, because I'm giving this lecture during a time when the C19 virus continues to be a, a, a thorn in the side of not just America but the world, it is fascinating to read a few lines of Manzoni's uh, treatment of the plague. So I'll just I'll just jump into three different places here. In in, in the early part of uh, of the chapter 31, this is how he says it: The Board of Health solicited precautions and cooperation. It was all but in vain. And in the board itself, their solicitude was far from equaling the urgency of the case. That is to say, in other words, they couldn't really see that this was a serious problem coming. A few lines later, we hear this. Among the public, also, this obstinacy in denying the pestilence gave way naturally and gradually disappeared in proportion as the contagion extended itself and ex extended itself to before their own eyes by means of contact and intercourse and still more when, after having been for some time confined to the lower orders, it began to take effect upon the higher. And then all of a sudden, people started to really freak out. And then a few lines later, he says this, from the inventions of the illiterate vulgar, educated people borrowed what they could accommodate to their ideas. From the inventions of the educated, the vulgar borrowed what they could understand, and as they best could. And of all, an undigested, barbarous jumble was formed of public irrationality. Well, uh, the end of August 1630, we'll see the death in Milan of so many serious problems. Renzo is going to be troubled by letters from Lucina's mom, Agnese, uh, who is recovering from the plague. So he will return to his village to find that the inhabitants are, are dead. I mean, corpses just piling up everywhere, and his own house and vineyard destroyed. In other words, he comes back to his Ithaca in complete and utter disarray, right? All of a sudden, uh, things like a warrant and Don Rodrigo are all pretty much forgotten. And uh, Renzo will learn that Lucia is, in fact, in Milan, which will lead us to the conclusion of the novel, chapters 34 through 38. He will arrive in Milan, and he's astonished, blown away by the state of the city because of the, because of the, the, the plague. The way he's dressed immediately makes him look suspicious as a possible anointer, as the novel will tell us. That is to say, some kind of foreign agent who is spreading the plague in some way through Milan. And, uh, and so he has to address these challenges. He will learn that Lucia is now sick in Milan, along with 16,000 other people uh, of the plague. But we actually find out that Lucia is, it, she, she's actually recuperating, recovering from the plague. Renzo and Lucia are reunited. reunited. We're told it's been 20 months of time, which is why this is a somewhat long novel. Um, they're reunited by um, Friar Christopher. Um, but Renzo first wants to visit and forgive the dying Don Rodrigo. This is a huge part of the novel, that Renzo is willing to say to, um, to Don Rodrigo, I, I forgive you for what you've done and all the horror that you've caused my life. Then we're going to have Christopher who will um, f um, absolve the vow of chastity or celibacy uh, on the part of Lucia, which will obviously allow them for them to later become man and wife, the title of the novel, again, The Betrothed. Renzo's going to walk through a rainstorm <laughs> to see Lucia's mom, um, and then they come back. 
Lucia and Renzo finally are married by Don Avendino, so we have this cyclical feel of the, of the novel. And the couple will then begin a new life uh, as, uh, you know, um, at a silk mill at the gates of Bergamo, and that's kind of how the, the story then will end. Well, what are we going to say at level 2A? Well, obviously, one of the major messages here is the strength of love and the power and conviction of honor and respect to overcome dishonor and disrespect. At 2B, well, I'd like us to think a little bit about symbolism in this novel. I mean, there's so many ways to think about irony in, in, in this novel, but I want us to think about symbolism in this novel, especially the unnamed. That is to say, the conversion experience. The unnamed symbolizes in some way the ability to change your life, to make a decision that alters the way you've been living, and certainly that we have the symbolism at, at play here. At 3A, since we've mentioned it so often, let's go ahead and mention it again with the Odyssey. Again, it is the next text, volume 22 of the Harvard Classics. No question that Manzoni is playing a clear game. The other name that, it, it, interestingly, is not mentioned very regularly or often in this novel is Dante. And we can certainly think about Dante's journey in the Divine Comedy in very similar kind of ways. Renzo is a classic example of a hero who will be totally different from the kind of person that he is by the end, and yet fundamentally he's still a good guy, still the same, right? Finally, at 3B, a way to relate this to ourselves. What was a time that you had to endure great struggle to succeed, right? Or what was a time when you had to forgive someone for doing something that was inappropriate behavior towards you? Well, I hope that our comments here have led you to want to pick up the novel and actually read it. The compelling chapters of 31 through 33 and the treatment of the plague, it's quite remarkable. Thank you.